Okay, so maybe I'll just say the the kind of most important, the main input into proving this theorem um, is uh, a corollary of this Kuznetsov trace formula due to Desiree and Ivanovich. So main input um, so is a theorem of So maybe I'll just state it in a very simple form and then I'll kind of say what uh, a more general version is that'll be the one that's actually used. But so I'm gonna let uh, C, M, and N uh, are gonna be three parameters. And then I'm gonna let G, M, and C uh, be uh, function, a non-oscillatory supported on uh, a product of these three intervals. So what is that? Start with M. Then I have sum over C and a sum over M and a sum over N. Okay, and then A sub M and B sub N are any sequences. Of complex numbers, of course. Uh, B, M, and then here I've got S, M, S and minus M, C. Okay, then I have the following estimate, I have c to the 1 plus epsilon uh, root m n, and then the L2 uh, norms of a and b. So remember here that this is, uh, uh, we've been using the classical normalization of this Klusterman sum. So this is actually about size c to the 1 half if I take the, the Weil bound. So this is kind of saying that I save a full power of c to the 1 half when I go in average over uh, over many different moduli. Okay, so if you compare this to what Philippe wrote down in his in, in his lecture, um, and if you maybe take the situation where m and n are both about c to the one half, which is sort of the hard range, here you see once you average over c, you you, you save a full half power of c in that in that point. So you know often when we're doing analytic number theory, we have sums inside sums inside sums inside sums. So often you can get more cancellation rather than just taking absolute value all the way in. Um, okay, so what actually goes into the proof of this theorem is something slightly more general, which I alluded to before when I made a remark after writing down the, the, the Knetsov formula. The, the cutoff, so G, oh yeah, 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 thank you. Um, so I'll, do this, and I'll write G, M, M, C, okay? Because that's determining the length of the sum. <laughs> okay, so, so more generally, um, There was this story of the Kuznetsov formula that I've written at the top of the board is just at the Poincaré series at infinity, the Fourier expansion at infinity. But more generally, we're gonna work with other cusps, more generally using other cusps other than infinity. We can actually handle sums of the following kind, so sum over C, sum over M, sum over M. Uh, maybe I'll say C, so I'll let um, Q and R be relatively prime integers, and I'm only gonna sum over the C's which are relatively prime to R, 
And then here I'm going to have the Klusterman sum with uh, m r inverse plus or minus m c q. Okay, and then this is also going to be less than less than something nice. So, okay, it's, it's ugly to write down, but a uh, strong bound, I'll say. And if you want to look at exactly what you get, okay, I refer you to the paper of Dejvin and Vanyach. But these sort of more general things turn out to be pretty useful in a lot of contexts. So, okay, so I don't know. I have about, see how, what kind of sketch I can give of this, uh, so I'm gonna be following, I guess, the paper of Fouvry and Ivanich. Um, so we want to, of course, study the following thing. So Q and A being relatively prime. And then we're going to study the sums of the von Mangold function. Um, so the main, the first step is to use to some combinatorial decomposition of the von Mangold function. So this is X known as the Heath-Brown identity. Which seems to be the most uh, flexible version of one of these combinatorial identities. And it's certainly the one that is most useful for this problem. Uh, so let's see, I'm going to let z be at least 2. Um, j is going to be a natural number. And then also I'm going to say that 2z to the j is strictly bigger than m. OK, and then the following sort of uh, decomposition. So there's going to be many parameters here. So it's uh, m1 product up to mj strictly less than z, and then a product of Mobius functions And then a sum over a bunch of n variables constrained by uh, the product of the m variables up to j, and one product of n variables up to nj log of m1. Okay, this allows us to kind of get rid of the primes from the, the story. So if I apply this Heath-Brown identity to the quantity that I want to estimate here, um, and I also put in a, a partition of unity to localize all the variables, the sums I have to deal with are of the following shape. So I'm going to let um, capital M1 up to capital Mj. Oh, uh, I, I should say we're going to use Heath-Brown's identity. Um, with j equal to 4. <laughs> okay, so m capital letters are going to denote uh, dyadic ranges of sizes for each of these variables. Okay, and so what we're going to need to do is need to handle the following sums. sum over the moduli q a lambda of q. And then I have the m i variables uh, in a dyadic range about size m i, and then the n i variables in a dyadic range about size n i, and always constrained so that m 1 uh, up to m j, m 1 up to n j is equal to n. 
and I have some Mobius functions. Um, okay, times. So the indicator function of uh, the arithmetic progression. need to handle this. Um, okay, so you can write out a decomposition like this plus a admissible error. Okay, so I drop the log and, uh, oh, here, this should have been equal to n. I drop the log and I drop the condition here, but you can do this up to an admissible error. Okay, and so then the game is to try to arrange these sets of parameters, these sizes for the different variables, m1 up through mj, and n1 up through nj, and pick a, um, kind of arrange them into two pieces, okay? Um, so we're gonna uh, take a partition into two sets. To get uh, bilinear forms. So the kind of bilinear forms that one gets and one kind of ends up having to treat. Um, I'll write down next. So maybe I'll let um, Alpha, beta, gamma, delta sequences uh, all bounded by the k divisor function. And also uh, such that just the last one, one of them, such that delta uh, is well distributed in, re in residue classes. So this means it has a, a Siegel-Wolfus theorem for it. Okay. Um, so, i.e., you have something like maybe here n is about size m on both sums. m to an arbitrary power a. Okay, and then the sort of sums that we're going to arrange these bigger messes into look like this. So it's going to have m, n, uh, q, and r. So maybe a sum like this. q goes up to q, alpha. R goes up to R, beta R, gamma M, M to size M, and then the delta is the thing in the middle. Ah, here it's M times M is. Uh, Okay, so the goal is to show that these have some cancellation room. So maybe it's uh, m n is about size x. Uh,
So the goal is for m n running up to x, q uh, kind of staying away from the extreme. And then I guess r maybe I can always assume m to the 1 half uh, something like this so if i can prove such an estimate um what it suffices to do is kind of is give a combinatorial rearrangement of all these different parameters into two uh, disjoint sets, which are going to become the m and the n over here. Um, but it's sort of crucial in uh, combinatorial decomposition of these buckets m1, mj n1 up to n j uh, that I that the that the q and the r depend on m and n right so so for every different choice of decomposition of these different ranges I want to be able to pick q and r adapted to exactly that size of m and n and it's here that one uses the well factor ability of the lambda okay so so here we need uh, lambda is well factorable. Um, just kind of give a very, maybe one, two more lines here just to give you an idea, of hopefully, where uh, the Klusterman sums come from. So the first step in sort of achieving this goal is, uh, well, what we're going to do is we're going to use Cauchy-Schwartz to smooth two of the variables. So I'm going to um, let sort of, I'm going to smooth the, the, the gamma variable and the alpha variable. So smooth uh, approximations to intervals. And so then I have uh, the absolute value squared of this gets bounded by uh, qn, maybe log x to some power. Um, times something d, so d is going to be some like this, and then I'm going to have some betas in the middle. is about times r, and here it's going to be mn, n is about times n, and da, 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 here n is about times n, squared. Okay, so then I, I square out and I get something like uh, w minus 2v plus u, and then each of by expanding this square, each of w, 2v, and u is going to have a main term that cancels with each other. And then I'm going to get like two r variables and two n variables. So w is going to be the hardest.
and we're going to end up with four variables. Uh, R1, N1, R2, N2. Uh, and they're each going to have some congruence conditions like this. And this will actually, okay, there's some residue classes and I can expand them using plus on summation. And this is going to give actually uh, Klusterman sums um, of modulus R1N2. So there's this kind of interesting thing that happens, sorry I'm out of time, where after you expand the square, I get these four variables, R1, N1, R2, N2, and the R and N variables from the two factors in the square kind of get crossed to produce these Klusterman sums after you resolve everything with additive characters and plus on summation. So sorry I ran out of time, but um, I'll stop there. Um, so it seems it's pretty important in this argument that, uh, that I have a lot of flexibility in all the different ranges that I can take the M and the N. So there's kind of a lot of other little bells and whistles that I brushed under the rug here. But among them <laughs> is that um, for certain ranges of the M and N, uh, I can treat the delta with this Siegel-Volpis condition. And in other ranges, I can assume delta looks just like the indicator function of an interval. Okay, so this goes into this kind of like combinatorial arrangement. Sometimes I can take the delta to be looking like the smooth variables, and sometimes I can take the delta to be looking like uh, the Mobius functions, okay? And then I can actually get stronger results, um, meaning for like better ranges of Q and R in the case where I have a smooth variable all the way on the inside of these bilinear sums than if I have the, the, the Mobius function all the way on the inside. Um, and it's kind of like you can just eke out and use enough of that extra advantage to finish the problem. So I would say like here one of the advantages is all of a sudden you go from having something like the lambda function to having this great flexibility in all these different parameters that you can arrange and play different games with and try to win a little bit by either choosing a, a smooth or non-smooth variable when it's advantageous. So that's maybe in the, this context, that would never be possible if I tried to do something with the lambda function directly. And for the more general picture, well, I don't, I don't have that much of a sense. Isn't this how Silberg proved his result? Yeah, it was like a second or two uh, yeah. yeah. I think that's the, I think. Yeah, so in fact. Uh-huh. Yeah. So is that written down in like the uh, discontinuous groups paper or? Because he sort of mentions it in the, the paper on estimation of Fourier coefficients, but he doesn't really like give a, a, a full proof of that. So did he write it down or did he just kind of claim it and? Okay, yeah, I see. So. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. The paper is about Poincaré series, and then he has this result, and he doesn't give all the details. But so, 
it's clear he's kind of thinking about this. He's not really thinking about the general version of the, the trace formula. But he doesn't really give all the details. <laughs> But Gelbar Jacques do like just a little better, right? They get strictly bigger than three over sixteen. Is that right? No, 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 no. That's well, another paper I'm thinking of. Okay, okay. Yeah. And then finally. Uh huh. Yeah. And then if you have the symmetric fourth and fifth, that's the Kim Sarno. So. Then in this, uh, you have the method to detect translation in the first and second step. Yeah. In the field system. Yeah. Mm hmm. Thank you.